Good timing. Okay. Uh, hey, everyone. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ben. And thanks again to everyone for coming out. Um, my name is uh, Janemann Nordhagen. Um, I was most recently um, the programmer for Gone Home. Uh, and prior to that, I worked at a 2K Marin on the Bioshock series. And prior to that, at Sony Research and Development. Um, in the PS2 to PS3 transition time. Um, so, I chose the uh, title of my talk today, uh, Programmers, Who Needs Them? Because uh, I really like pandering to my audience, so I figure, you know, <laughs> they should be really popular with a crowd of mostly programmers, right? Um, but uh, I want to start at the very beginning of things, the 90s. Uh, it was a great time for lots of things, especially gaming and gaming technology. Um, if you played games, especially PC games at the time, uh, you remember staying up until 4 a.m. tweaking your BIOS and drivers, and if you were lucky, still having a running PC afterwards. Um, you might remember knowing where Northbridge was uh, and worrying about the speed of your I.O. buses. Uh, it's not really like that now, though, uh, is it? You barely need a graphics card to run a lot of games, uh, even PC games. We've stopped caring as much, or maybe at all, about the way our games look, and they've stopped making the giant leaps and bounds in technology that they used to. Now, uh, when you read gaming news, the headlines are about the music, the art, the mechanics, the story, or even the business model uh, of your game, not about the technology. Part of that is that it suddenly got a lot harder for CPU and GPU manufacturers to make things go faster. Um, part of it is because we started doing actually interesting things with games along the other axes. Um, and a big part of it is that we expanded the audience and the scope of games so that collectively we care about more than just graphics and tech. We're no longer exclusively nerds making games for nerds, uh, and that's a really great thing. So, though, um, if technology is less important in games, uh, what does that mean for the people who make the technology for games? Well, um, we've never been that important, honestly. <laughs> I think we're getting less so. Um, here's an analogy for you. This is analogy number one, the band analogy. Um, if we ima imagine a game dev team as a fairly standard rock group, uh, the designers and writers are out front. They're the, the front people, the singers. They form the co crowd's conscious experience of the music. Um, and incidentally, they get most of the groupies. Uh, the artists and level designers are guitarists. They kind of provide the hummable melody that people dance along with. Programmers are the bass players. Um, it takes work to consciously see their contribution, uh, but it underlies the whole performance. Producers are the rhythm section. Uh, they provide timing. They can be replaced easily with a drum machine. Um, you hardly ever see famous bass players notice, uh, or, or famous programmers for that matter. Uh, Paul McCartney is a songwriter, so he's like a programmer slash designer, kind of. Um, Ringo is like the production intern. Um, so our work underlies the entire piece, uh, but it's not usually very visible. In my experience in the industry, as a game programmer, um, what we usually are doing is building tools. We ask designers and artists, uh, and content creators in general, uh, what problems do you have? And then we try and solve those problems. If we're good at our jobs, we solve those problems in a way that makes it really easy for them to do their jobs, so much so they never notice what we've done. Uh, analogy number two, Sistine Chapel. Michelangelo painted the roof of the Sistine Chapel. He's famous for it. Um, people come from all over the world to admire it. Uh, how many people know who designed the scaffolding so he could get up and paint the roof? It's just as necessary for the finished work, but we don't care about it nearly as much. Um, it was a means to an end, right? Probably any carpenter on the street could have built the scaffolding uh, to paint this, the roof. So there's a thing to aim for with technology and games. Uh, it should be a means to an end rather than the end in itself. What does that mean? Um, it means probably don't build your own engine. It means take the easiest way to achieve a technical goal. Lots of programmers, uh, myself included, um, see the fun of a good technical challenge, right? We, we like the appeal of solving a hard problem. Um, we also really like to know that we've done something ourselves to kind of own that um, and everything. But that's not always helpful, um, and it won't necessarily be the best thing for your game. 
Uh, these days, there's so much tech out there that's already been built um, that you can use that to make your own platform that you can stand on to reach the ceiling, uh, and you can paint your own unique masterpiece. Uh, although, to be fair, uh, Michelangelo actually built his own specially designed scaffolding, so he's, <laughs> he's a programmer slash artist. Um, when you make a game, if it's not just a perfect clone of another game, uh, you'll need to solve some interesting problems presented by the design you're pursuing. So that's your masterpiece. Um, those are the best problems to spend your time solving. You should solve those problems and spend your energy on those, uh, not on coding a new renderer that is slightly better than, or let's be honest, nearly as good as something that's already out there. You should solve your problems because I guarantee you'll have enough of those to keep you busy without worrying about a bunch of problems other people have already solved. You can see that this is happening a bit in the world of games already. Um, we've made a lot of technology that helps people make games to the point where programming isn't really a major problem anymore, right? You can make a game with Twine, uh, Game Maker, Flash, Unity, um, and it's, it's much easier than it used to be. So uh, The Novelist uh, is a great game. It's by my friend uh, Kent Hudson. Um, he made it entirely without a programmer on the team. He used Uscript, which is a Unity add-on, uh, to do all the logic behind the game. There's many other indie developers who don't even consider programming as something that they do uh, or identify as programmers. Um, a quote from Mike Bithell, uh, he made Thomas Was Alone. He said, uh, I'm a shit coder, but fuck it, my games work. So he's a shit coder, but clearly profanity is a skill he's mastered. Um, I just set foot back in the US after a few months of traveling the world. Um, I was in Japan, and while traveling through Kyoto, I met a cool indie developer. Uh, his name is Sagar Patel. Um, and it turned out that I was assigned to judge as the IGF judge for his entry frequency domain. We just discovered this after meeting, and it turned out to you know, this awesome random uh, coincidence. Uh, anyway, frequency domain, it's a cool thing. It takes music uh, and transforms it into game levels. It's something like audio surf. Um, while we were talking, he mentioned that he doesn't think of himself as a programmer either. So he wrote software that reads music files from the hard drive, breaks down their component information, dynamically building 3D spaces based on it, and allowing the player to navigate through these spaces. Um, but he's not really a programmer. Uh, so I don't know who, who is a programmer then in that case. Uh, so the point I'm coming back to here is that technology and coding are fading into the background. How you accomplish something is much less important than what you actually accomplish. And sometimes you can say more with Twine than with Unreal. I think there's this pervasive myth that programming the right way is really hard, or that real programming is really hard. And there's this reverse, too, that if it's not hard, it's not real programming. Um, it's a myth that we tell outsiders or newcomers. Uh, you know, people speak about algorithms and data structures and making their own languages and coding their own compilers. Uh, and if you haven't done that yet or don't know how you would go about doing that, you're not really a programmer. In fact, um, programming is, is a way of thinking, and it's not all that hard. Uh, I mentioned earlier uh, that Kent made the novelist without a programmer, but if you look at Uscript, it's a visual scripting language, right? And arranging these little blocks in a particular way to achieve your effect is not really that different from doing the same thing with text in an IDE. Um, so this, this myth about real programming is, is something we tell ourselves, too. Um, oh, you use JavaScript, right? That's not a real programming language. But you know what? Um, it's just as Turing complete as C or Lisp is. Uh, we, we create these artificial barriers around real programming because I think we're scared of someone pulling back the curtain and showing that, hey, there's not all that much to it. <laughs> um, there is a lot of skill involved in being able to write a compiler or really efficient uh, a star implementation or a great sorting algorithm, right? Um, and you should be proud if you can do those things. But you're not any less of a real programmer if you can't do them. And I think that actually uh, this attitude of protecting the priesthood um, is a big reason why so many coders suffer from imposter syndrome, right? We have this idea that we build up in our minds that in order to be a real programmer, you have to know all of this arcane 
fascinating stuff. And because we occasionally have to look up this syntax of templates in C++ or, you know, figure out again how pointers in C work, we must not be a real programmer. If we were really a programmer, we'd know all that stuff and it looks like everybody else does, right? Um, so that's bullshit. Uh, this is also true about programming languages, uh, as I touched on already. Um, when I was coming up as a programmer, it was a truth universally acknowledged that a programmer creating a game uh, needed to use C, or better yet, assembly, right? C++ is highly suspect, um, and of course there's no way anyone could ever make a video game in a garbage collected language. So I took these as established truths, and I'm sure with the state of hardware and garbage collection at the time, they were probably a lot more true than they are now. But at one point when I worked at Sony, um, I had to implement JavaScript uh, for a PS2 web browser we were working on. And I tested it by making a Pong clone. And it took me about half a day to make a Pong clone in JavaScript. And I thought, wow, that was easy and fun and fast and all the things that programming usually isn't. What's going on? Um, but of course, uh, it was still impossible to use JavaScript to make real games. Um, so I went on to work on, on SPU programming after that, uh, which is the exact opposite. It's very intense, performance-driven uh, design and coding. Uh, you have to manually unroll your loops and drop into assembly and be very careful about how your data is arranged and what language features you used and where and when you used pointers and basically everything you do, right? And that was a lot of fun, actually. Uh, as a programmer, it was... It was really challenging and really amazing to be able to, you know, to do all this complicated stuff and make very fast things happen. Um, but it was a lot of work. And you know what? Everyone else thought so too. Uh, even the professional uh, hardcore programmers at all the game studios out there. Um, and that's why the PS4 doesn't have SPUs. Um, even though parallelism is kind of the logical future of performance-driven hardware design, um, it just reached a point where the trade-off in the ease of use for people making this hardware work wasn't worth the increase in performance that you got. And if it's not already clear, I think that point is kind of far before you get to SPUs, because it turns out um, technical improvements aren't actually that important, right? Uh, one more analogy, the Citizen Kane of analogies. Um, Citizen Kane was a groundbreaking film. Um, but actually, it was groundbreaking at the time that it came out because of the technical filmmaking innovations it used. These days, when we watch this, we don't think of those things. Um, we don't notice them or realize that they are going on at all unless someone tells us about them, right? Um, it's hard to see that except in, in, uh, in that case. Um, there's also this Alfred Hitchcock movie, uh, Rope. You think about Hitchcock, you think about the birds, you think about Psycho, the 39 steps, right? You don't, you don't think about Rope. Um, it's not a great movie, uh, and Alfred Hitchcock himself thinks so. Uh, basically, the only thing interesting it did was it tried to use a single continuous take through the whole thing. Um, it was a cool technical experiment, uh, but it was not a great work of art. So I'm sure we can all think of games that were the rope of their day, um, and we can think of a lot of games that are Citizen Kane's, apparently, especially if you look at the headlines, uh, game news sites. Um, those are games that do exciting technical things, but in service of, you know, great mechanics or a powerful, well-told story, and that's what lives on in our memories as being a great game. So, given that tech isn't as important anymore, that it doesn't necessarily contribute to great games or great art, and that we should be doing our best to support other creators in our tasks, what does that mean? So once again, unless you're developing something 100% new, of which there are very few things, uh, you shouldn't be writing your own engine. You should download or buy all the code that you can and build what you need on top of that. You should avoid making complex systems where you can instead put power into the hands of artists and designers making small, flexible, human-driven tools. All of this comes from my experience in AAA games, where I saw these techniques succeed. Um, and I also saw lots of techniques where the opposite approach hurt or killed the project both personally and in the stories of other AAA developers I've talked to. Uh, XCOM. <coughs> uh, trying not to do this can be very really frustrating, though. Um, if you use Unity, like so many indie developers have, you know there are a lot of things you can't do with it. It's really frustrating. <laughs> um, if you've ever used a different engine, like Unreal, um, that'll drive you mad. 
With Unreal, you can rewrite anything you want. Um, you have all the full source code, so you can replace bits of the engine from the ground up until you've basically written a new one, um, which was kind of what the Bioshock engine was. Uh, it was so heavily modified that we couldn't even integrate new uh, Unreal drops uh, anymore because everything had changed. Um, with Unity, though, you don't have access to the source code. Uh, so you're limited to sort of skimming along the surface of the technology and fiddle with the inputs and outputs of this black box um, that you're given in order to create a game. And, you know, again, that sounds really frustrating, but it can actually be really liberating. Um, creativity thrives on limitations, right? So speaking from experience on Gone Home, um, eventually you stop grumbling uh, and you learn to use the tools at your disposal to achieve what you want. Or you'll expand your definition of what you actually want. Uh, or you'll realize that what you wanted wasn't really necessary. Or in trying to find another way to do things, you'll come across something that's much more elegant than your original idea was. Um, so again, when making Gone Home, there were plenty of times when I was really frustrated that I didn't have the power that I was used to having with Unreal. Um, but looking back, if I had been able to rewrite everything that I'd wanted to in the engine that we used, I would never have been able to finish the game in the time that we had. Um, letting go of that worry was really, really nice. So what I'm saying is sometimes uh, restraints can be enjoyable. Um, of course, there's some exceptions to never writing your own engine. Um, if you've already made a custom engine, you should use it. If you're doing something entirely new, like Minecraft, uh, you'll probably have to write everything yourself. Uh, although Notch himself did say uh, some positive things, maybe, about Unity. Uh, he, he sees the benefits. Um, and of course, there are times when you need to be able to write efficient code, right? There's times when C is the right choice and JavaScript is the wrong one. Um, there's times when writing your own major system or your own engine is the right approach. On Gone Home, um, I wrote a gigantic input system. Unity gives you an input system. Um, and even if you don't like that, you can buy a bunch of other ones on the asset store. But mine's better. <laughs> uh, and I'm glad I wrote it. It was the right choice to do so. Um, and how do you do that? How do you draw the line and figure out when it's the right approach? That's a really good question. Um, I wish I had a 100% answer to it. But uh, I think that's, that's the skill that good game programmers have, actually, is rather than the ability to write a faster loop, you know when you should work. Uh, Generally, though, um, again, in the new era of games, programmers and technology will and should fade into the background. Uh, I recently read this book, um, The Design of Everyday Things. It's really great. You should read it. Um, I resisted picking it up because I'm not a designer, so I didn't want to read about design. Um, and then I got half a chapter into it, and I said to myself, wait a second, uh, the things that this book is talking about are things that I've learned or dealt with. Um, so I guess maybe software design is design? Uh, and yeah, that's why it's called that. Um, but generally, like we, we, we separate these things out in common usage or in our brains, right? We, we think of software design as being about efficiency and elegance from this kind of austere, um, objective, rational point of view. We don't really consider software design uh, from a human point of view, usually. Um, and of course, that's an even more relevant point of view if your aim is to design tools, as it probably should be, rather than design APIs or functionality. Um, so here's a quote uh, in which the author is talking about how often we, uh, as people, are to blame, uh, how often we think we're to blame when dealing with difficult to understand functionality. Um, that is, when something goes wrong with a machine, we usually say something like, oh, I'm stupid, or I don't know how to use these things, or, or something like that, right? And he says, uh, it's time to reverse the situation, to cast the blame upon the machines and their design. It is the machine and its design that are at fault. It is the duty of machines and those who design them to understand people. It is not our duty to understand the arbitrary, meaningless dictates of machines. So if you think of software as machines, because um, software is a machine, right? Um, this quote not only tells us how to be better designers of those software machines, um, it tells us what to expect as users of software machines, which we also are, right? Um, we should expect that over time, the specialized knowledge of software designs, um, of these arbitrary dictates of machines, will be less important as the design of them matures. So 
Currently, programmers command respect partially because of our knowledge of these arbitrary rule sets, right? We know how to talk to machines. We know how to speak this weird arcane language. Um, we're part of this priesthood um, of knowledge. We're the ones who know how to read and write in an illiterate society, basically. Um, except as time goes on, uh, things will be designed better and everyone will be able to understand and interface with these machines. And again, we're seeing this already, uh, right? Um, game maker, Twine, Unity, they're opening game creation up to a whole class of people that it wasn't open to before. Um, so as programmers, we are becoming less important. We'll still have the advantage of knowing how to think and design systemically. Um, we'll have the experience about how to solve problems in the particular manner that you, that you solve programming problems in. Um, and we'll be able to more easily foresee upcoming problems down the road. Um, but hopefully, everyone in the world will be able to use the arcane tools and machines that we currently are the specialists in. OK, so uh, to sum up, um, if you want to be famous and get groupies, don't be a programmer. Um, if you want to help make great works, uh, you should be a means to an end. Don't make technology an end in itself. Um, and unless you're writing Minecraft or already have an engine sitting around, uh, you should build on top of other technology as much as you can. Swallow your ego and use off-the-shelf engines. Uh, buy third-party code. Hire smart programming contractors. Uh, make small, simple tools instead of complex, all-encompassing systems. And you should write your software and tools for people to use. So, thanks for having me. Um, and for sitting quietly <laughs> as I tore apart your aspirations and your profession. Um, I, I appreciate the chance to be able to crush dreams in person, but uh, if you want me to crush your dreams remotely, here's my contact information. Feel free to reach out at any point in time. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Andy Nguyen. I'm a professor here at the Game Innovation Lab and the Game Center. I'm going to start this Q&A and then hand it off to the audience after I've uh, asked my laundry list of questions that I've written down here. So the first one is, and this is so obvious to me, uh -huh. now, you've, now it sounds like you've like, had this major insight that, like, yeah, why would I write this myself? How many years did it take you to come to that insight? Like, and I say this because you, you said you used to be like a low-level PS2 to PS3 transition program, or I guess that was like around the, the duck demo? Was yes, that, I mean, uh, that was my job, making duck demos. You were on the duck demo? I, well, Wasn't that Wait, so there were a bunch of duck demos. Yeah, I, so I, Dylan Cuthbert made one, I yes, think. Yes, and, that was one of the first. Right. First does, anyone here know, does anyone here know the PS3 duck demo? Is this, there was actually, it was, there, there, there was a whole history of duck demos that started, I think, with the PS2, and... For some reason, someone chose to demo technology using like these uh, three rubber, ducks. Model rubber ducks. And from then on, it kind of became the signature of all Sony tech demos is that you would show a bunch of rubber ducks doing really impressive things. And I, this, I, I don't know what, I don't know what the idea it's was. Sigwaf, Sigwaf. I think Sigwaf is to blame. Right? Um, like Sigwaf is to blame because they'd always like throw a bunch of stuff just in a box and it's like, oh, look, it stacks well. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's all I was showing off. Okay, I should, uh, anyway. Anyway, yes. Uh, but the point is like, so how long, yeah, so how long did you, so you must, so at some point I assumed that you were like, like every programmer. Or you, where you were like, I, oh, I gotta do it myself, and ownership, and it's amazing, and I'm a better engineer than everyone else. Like, did you go through those phases? I did, and actually, like, I started a lot of game projects, and I think this is where this comes from. I started a lot of game projects, um, you know, like, writing my own render and being like, okay, my render is going to be awesome. It's going to support both DirectX and OpenGL, you know, like back when that was that was a thing. And uh, well, I would run on I, Windows, Linux. and Right, exactly. Yeah, you know, and I'm going to write my own uh, input system and everything like this. I'm going to write my own memory manager. Like, you know, it's got this Always cool, a good cool, idea. cool sort of thing and everything like that. And you know how far I got on any of these games? Uh, not that far. Do you have the memory manager? Do you have the memory manager? I... I, I I think once I got a memory manager going, right, and everything like this, like I would build these little pieces of technology, and then I would, I would start all over from the beginning again, and then I realized, like, okay, you know what, I'm never gonna make a game like this. Like, this is this is. And so this was all in parallel to working at Sony, or did you was this? This was yeah before and during working at Sony. Um, I did this stuff, and actually, uh, I lie, I did I did manage to make a complete 
very, very simple game um, early on. But eventually I realized that like, yeah, that wasn't, that wasn't really the interesting part or there are ways in which solving technical problems is an interesting part, right? It's, it's like uh, doing, you know, the crossword puzzle or something like that, right? It, it's, it's really satisfying to be able to do this stuff. But at the same time, you know you're not contributing much to the world, right? Like a bunch of other people have already written their own memory managers, right? And unless you're really, really good and willing to open source your code and everything like that and willing to do all the fights you have to do to convince people that your technology is better than their technology, you're not going to make much of an impact with that, right? Um, you, if you, if you have ideas about games, like actual games, and not just like memory managers, then you have to get to the point of being able to make these games. And if you have to, you know, we are aware of the fact that there are, and I mean, we're saying this right here. Well, we're talking about games, obviously, like that's what we're all here for. But there are people who live in a community where, if you write the best memory manager, you're a superstar. Right. It's a small community. <laughs> yeah, it exists. No, no, no right? it's definitely true. There, there are, but I, I question whether that's the gaming community we're no, talking about now, no, or it's the memory no, management. It's the memory management community. community. Yeah, exactly. Right. And but, but, I, I guess I, this is me separating myself from the memory manager community and joining the gaming community, where I want to talk about, you know. Cool art style. I'm, so, I'm still going to dig in on this because I'm interested. So you were a programmer at Sony, I was right? So Sony, yeah. yeah, so you were in the pool of all the other programmers. So did you already feel at the time that this was like that the culture within self-identifying programmers was not necessarily what you were most interested in, hmm. or, or where did you just like outgrow it? I think I think there's there's a couple things. I think like I personally yeah changed. Like I I realized like I'm reinventing the wheel way too many times here, right? This is not this is not a good way to do it. Plus, when you work in a place like research and development, right? And I wasn't I wasn't a, a researcher. I was part of the apps team. You know, we made the rubber duck demos based on other but I was in this room with these incredibly smart people, right? Um, uh, just I don't know, famous names, right? And it's mind blowing. And it's like there's no way I can do these things better than these people can, right? Um, so I should let them do that, and I'll do something that I can do. Um, and along with that, I think like the world changed too, right? Um, it became actually possible. It really did used to be that if you wanted to make your own game, you had to write your own uh, renderer, and you had to write your own memory manager, because there is, there's no alternative. You can't just go download something that does that. Um, but now you can, and that transition happened, you know, during during my career, and I'm glad it did. Um, and also, I think if if you look at my career, like I went from being again this research and developer programmer, like very hardcore low level stuff, and I deliberately went to a game studio where I could work on games. Um, and I've kind of deliberately been moving uh, more and more towards like the gameplay programmer side of things, and ignoring like separating myself. The first thing I worked on at 2K Marin was the PS3 port of Bioshock, uh, okay. the original Bioshock. Um, and after that, I was like, I don't want to do PS3 programming anymore. I want to do uh, gameplay and AI programming. And so that's what I ended up doing on Bioshock 2. And, you know, I don't know, I've kind of been deliberately pushing that stuff. So you've been making the transition from, from, what you, from the self-identified programmer to a designer? Is that, would you feel more like that? Do you feel yeah, like... I, I think I think something along those lines. Or I don't know that. I don't know. I think that especially it, with the indie world as exciting as it is, I'm not sure that we need, need labels anymore. Well, that's a good know. point. That's a good uh, point. You know, so I, how, okay. So you, without labels, how much uh, how much did you use your own tools when you were working on Gone Home? Like how much did you contribute to? I mean, you guys are all sitting together. You must have design conversations, and I can only assume that you're part of the design discussion. Right. It's yeah, not like I mean, Steve's well, not going to keep you off in a separate room. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, um, especially systems design sort of stuff, right? You know, like um, when actually even in a big AAA studio where you have people like a bunch of people whose job title is systems designer, uh, as a gameplay programmer, you have a lot of say in those discussions about right. that, not, not just in the original, you know, discussions about systems design, but also when it comes down to time to implement it, like, that's in your hands. And if there's anything that hasn't been specified, you get to decide those things. You get to right. choose good initial values, and you get to 
also say things like, oh, um, I don't think you considered the way this works with this other system and maybe this, you know, I don't know, you get to give feedback and you're kind of, yeah, you're, you're, you're stepping along that path to designer already. Um, just in that interesting. Role. Yeah. It's interesting to bring up systems because I think that most people wouldn't consider Gone Home to be a very systems heavy game. It's not systems heavy. This uh, is true. But they, right. they exist, they, right? Exactly. They're there. So the yeah. thing is, because I have these conversations with Doug Wilson all the time, right? Creator of Joust. He, you know, he's like, go away from systems. We don't need systems. Like, mm, even in the game that you don't see them in, they exist. Okay. They're in Proteus. Proteus has systems. Yep. Right? They, they, it's always a thing. So. When you say initial values, that still brings up an interesting point, right? Because essentially, when you're using something like Unity, Unity will suggest those for for you, right? Like if for for many of the subsystems that exist in Unity, because they have to work out of the box. But right? if you drag an element into something, it's like, oh, here's here's a setting for the physics, or here's a setting for what your picture frame is going to weigh if you pick it up from the table and drop it back on the table. That's different. Right? So. Yep. How much of that did you feel that you needed to influence and modify to the feel that you wanted to go, that you guys wanted to have, or did you in, did you end up saying, "Bravo, you guys who made the mod the modules that we're using already did a really good job"? Well, I think I mean I think those are like again you don't you don't have any access to the source code, right? There's a limited number of things you can do with Unity, and all, almost all those things are expressed in those values windows, that you're about, right. right? Yeah, right. exactly, and so that's. Those are the handles we had, and so we messed around with that a lot. Even a lot. Okay. In a lot of cases, we'd end up setting it back to what the you know what it said in Unity. Uh, you know what what it came as. <laughs> tried well, stuff in it. But yeah, exactly. We tried stuff. Like oh, okay, they were they were right after all. You know. Okay. But, uh, well, the point is that's all you have. The reason I'm bringing it up is because people tend to say, oh, this feels like a Unity game, or this feels like an XYZ game. Like depending on what it was made in. Yeah. Right. Because of the fact that it's very tempting to just leave everything as it is. Right, and I think that that can potentially be bad, but what you're saying right now is that for for the specific type of game that you were going for, that you guys were going for, that worked out wonderfully, and it didn't turn out to be a detriment because it wasn't actually the focus of the game. Right, that that's me projecting, yeah. by the way. So right. that, that's me putting words in your mouth. I think that um, I think that the idea of like this is what a Unity game looks like or feels like or whatever. Um, I think that's true. Um, I think that was true a lot more in the past, and now there's been both. Um, there are enough things to mess with easily in Unity that it's you can diverge from that somewhat. Um, and also, we've just seen so many games that have been created in Unity that that have been so wildly divergent from each other. I have a hard time even seeing it. I didn't know until two weeks ago that Hearthstone was made in Unity. There's there's so right, many out like, there. That's like I mean you, you have everything from you know two D platformers to RTSs to first person games. You know I mean it's like yeah I don't know. There's there's so many things out there. Uh, but you guys started working. I don't know if this was part of when you were on it, right? But if I recall correctly, I remember Steve Gainer saying that he you experimented with the Friction Engine for a while. Yeah. Like that's the game with Penumbra and uh, Amnesia. Yeah, exactly. And what, what was that like? Like, why, why, how did how, did that like turn you off, and then you switched to Unity, or what's what's the story there? Uh, it's not that complicated of a story. Basically, um, Steve downloaded the. I mean, he he downloaded the engine and had the the mod tools or whatever for it. It was you know it's all just content sort of stuff, and it yeah. was like okay, um, you know this this has a lot of what we want to have and gone home, so maybe it would be worth building on this instead. And we reached out to them and said, hey, are you interested in licensing our your engine to us? Um, we want to build this kind of game with it. And they basically said, no, we're not interested in licensing our engine. That's it? Something. Yeah, we, we don't want to have to have the support that comes with you know, licensing out technology or anything. Um, we just don't want the hassle. Like we're we're not doing that, and so. And they didn't okay. even they didn't give you the option to like just use it. Nope. Yeah, we we didn't have. I mean. Okay. We could have, we could have made our game as okay. a mod for for Amnesia, right? But that's obviously not sufficient to what we wanted to do. We needed, uh, right. you know, more than that in there. Um, and so, and I, I don't want to paint them as. as no, 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 for sure not. That. It was just you know they didn't want to do it, and right. that's totally fine. Fair enough. And it's probably good for us that they didn't, honestly. I think it, it worked out a lot better the way, the way we did it. Right, so you guys made the game. Like, how long what was the development cycle for uh, Gone Home? It took about a year and a half to make. Um, from, which is from zero. From zero, yeah. Wow. Um, which is less time than we thought it was going to make, actually. We were shooting for about two years. Um, 
That doesn't so, ever happen. Exactly. That doesn't ever happen. We were we were really, really happy. Um, is, that, is, is, it, is it like a combination of unity and you guys being amazing? Or are you just, <laughs> just like... It's mostly us being amazing. Yeah, I mean, I'm obviously... <laughs> uh, I was like, here you go. <laughs> we were a team that we'd worked well together before, right? We'd, we'd been... We'd, we'd, Worked uh, in the AAA space before. This was on Minerva's Den. Yeah, Minerva's Den and, and Bioshock Two in general too. But Minerva's Den was sort of the small team project that was. Uh, you know, How small? How small was that team? Uh, I think it was I don't know ten to fifteen people somewhere in okay. there. Um, so you know, not gone home small, but definitely small for a AAA studio. Right. And that's I mean, obviously it was building on the game that already existed, so a lot of labor isn't accounted for in those fifteen people. But. Um, but anyway, yeah, we had this experience of working together already. We were all also professional AAA developers, so we knew how to make a game, and more importantly, we knew how to scope a game. Um, so we knew Good point. what we could do, and we knew about how long it would take us to do it. Um, and we also obviously very much played to our strengths, right? We had just come off making Bioshock, and Gone Home is, in a lot of ways, Bioshock without a lot of shooting, without any shooting, any without shooting. any... Uh, well, other things. people. <laughs> uh, exactly, yeah. Or, or other people, like, we basically took Bioshock and cut away all the hard parts, and we're like, okay, we think we can make this, you know. We've done it. We've done it. We've done the hard version. We can probably do the easy one, right? <laughs> That's interesting, because if you look back to the lineage of where all this stuff comes from, right, like, from the, from the Looking Glass days and from System Shock. System Shock didn't, I mean, it had enemies, but it didn't have people. Right? It didn't have, like, it did have, like, some weirdly animated things, but it didn't require a lot of voice acting. It didn't require a lot of interaction with other people. And even back then, I had this, the sense that this is a technical decision, right? This seems like, so how much of your, like, leaving out interaction with human beings was just straight up a technical, upfront, like, did we 100%? 100%? All, it was all a scoping decision. We were like, we can't tackle that. Like, once you, because the thing is, too, we wanted to make a game of, we knew we wanted a first-person game, and we wanted, you know, a, a honestly, triple-A level of fidelity and polish in it, right? And so once you sign on to do characters, people, uh, in with those sort of constraints, you're signing on for a lot. You need not only all the technical support for that, um, but you need the content creation time and the content creators, the people who know how to make characters, to animate characters, to rig characters, you know, and all of these weird uh, disciplines that come with, with, come, come with that, right? Um, and it... I don't know, it just balloons the size of your project a bunch, and we decided we didn't want that. I still can't believe that you were under set your below schedule. Like, you've, like, scheduled two years for this. How does one sit down at the beginning of the project and write up a two-year plan? I don't know. I, don't even, I have no idea. You don't. I mean, you don't... If, if you're doing it right, you don't, like, plan out exactly two years. You look at what you have to do, and you say, okay, this is how long this sort of thing has taken us in the past, um, and right. so we can guess that it will take about this amount of time, and then we add extra padding, and you know, so on and so forth, right? And it's like, you don't, you don't really know, uh, and you don't right. especially know, like, there's no way you can say, this is what we'll be doing at week 54 or whatever, right, of, of development, right. Um, but we can say, we think it'll take about this long. Um, and you can totally be wrong, right? I mean, right. Uh, a, a lot of games are. are. I mean, this is where I'm going to... Decide whether I go back to tech or just leave it in the ditch. I think I'll leave it in the ditch. Um, how did you got so? So I'm curious about the history of this. When you started working on the game, how much of the creative vision was just set in stone? Like how much had had the had been scripted out? Uh, we need these parts of content. We need this floor plan. We need almost none, basically. Oh, okay. Right? We. Again, then, then you can go up those around even more that you can, like, oh, it's going to take two years. Right, well, it's like a house. I, I don't know. It's going to be in a house. Yeah. Uh, it was, yeah, it was, it's going to be in a house. That, that was basically all we had. Uh, it was going to be in a house. We, the story wasn't written, nothing like that. Um, we didn't know the, the shape but, of things, except in, again, this very general way of we're going to make something that's going to be a story shock without, right. without shooting. Not even the story? Not even the, like, oh, the story? The actually, the, like, the final version of the story. Only without spoiling it. But very... Few, final few weeks of development, like we were uh, recording new voice acting and everything like that for the final. Interesting, because I do remember yeah. playing like a super early just tech demo of it that Steve sent my way, and I was like, I'm opening drawers. Yeah. And there are things in the drawers, and I was like, environmental storytelling, I wonder how that's going to work. Because like, at well, the time when I saw the first demo, I was like, this is all really crude. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. oops, I'm throwing around stuff. Yeah. 
But so it, it came together beautifully, right? Like I remember playing it with a friend on the couch, and it was like a four-hour thing that we just engaged in together. And it was a like wholly enjoyable experience. Right? It was like it felt mysterious. It felt like something was always looming, and it was, but it wasn't. And it was there was some really nice tension to it. So that you're, you're telling me now that that was all sort of kind of came together in the last yeah, few weeks. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, no, no, no. I, the tension and everything like that, like that was. A lot of the really good level design and everything like that. The only thing that came together in the last couple of weeks was the very ending of the story. Okay. Um, everything else, you know, kind of came together over the course of the project. And that's all, again, you know, the, the experience of the people involved. Steve is a spectacular level designer, right? He knows exactly what he's doing. Um, right. He's very good at, at yeah, environmental storytelling. Um, he's very good at writing. And he's really good at designing spaces that players like to explore. Um, he does a lot of research for that, right? Like he, I remember him tweeting pictures of him with like '90s magazines, like <laughs> yeah, stacks actually, and was, stacks of. That was mostly Carla. Um, okay. She sort of specializes in that variety of historical research. Like she did this for Bioshock, and she made sure um, everything was kind of period appropriate, and uh, you know went and found examples of the right kind of things for the artists to work on oh. um, and, you know, the posters and everything like that. And so she did the same thing for the 90s for Gone Home. Uh, God, it sounds so fun. <laughs> Doesn't it? Yeah, I know. Just like, sounds you know, great. Looking, looking I mean, I had a lot of fun playing it, but like, as the idea of just like, like tra time traveling to that and just like, oh, I remember this. Mm -hmm. I guess the last thing I'm going to ask about text is like the, the fact that you said something about how we gate it. We as programmers, technology people, how we do it. I think a lot of it is just using jargon, right? Like you said, you, you, even you, and maybe you didn't notice this, but you say stuff like an efficient A star algorithm. <laughs> yeah. How many here know what A star is? Okay, like not even half. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. See? <laughs> no, you're right. You're, you're right? It's like, what does that mean? Oh, let me make it simpler. Yeah. It says an efficient search on a graph. <laughs> What? Yeah. Right? What is a graph? It's a nav mesh. What? Yeah. Right? Like, I mean, throw around an arbitrary amount of jargon that is like, oh, I don't know what that means, right? But, but essentially, what you said is really important. It's not that hard. Yeah. It's really hard to communicate it in a way that everyone just understands oh, look, I'm walking from here to here along a line, and then from here to here, and it's shorter than this, and here's how you compute it. Right. Right. Here's how you explain to a computer how to do that. Right. Exactly. And I think that not like I don't I don't think it's necess necessary. Maybe that you know everyone even understands pathfinding at that level. You know, right. like not everyone needs to know how to how to make things well, you, paths. Um, you guys don't need there's, right. There's no the pathfinding. There's a lot of right? games that don't need yeah. pathfinding, and you can actually go and buy a pathfinding uh, package on the Unity Asset Store that will basically do it for you. Uh, another another game developer that I that I met along my travels um, was playing around with Unity, and he's uh, a level designer. He's not a programmer at all, and he downloaded this, this uh, th that's how I found yeah. out about it. He downloaded this pathfinding package, and he set it up and everything, and he's he does not know how to code C Sharp at all, and he right. has guys wandering around. Uh, and he just has to know where he places the, the, nav the navigation exactly, stuff. Some, someone who does know what A star means and knows all that stuff and has fun doing that, yeah. or makes money doing that, or whatever, you know, uh, is sitting in a room somewhere else right. making that so that other people can use it. And that's beautiful. <laughs> that is beautiful. I don't want to keep ordering that. Exactly, right? Because right. like, there are people like... out there who do, though, and we should let them do that. And that's, no, I'm totally fine with that. Great. Yeah. But exactly. I'm like, at some point, they go to the part where you just want to do the cool stuff. Exactly. Yeah. But the cool stuff is always in context, right? We just like games. Right? That's, that's essentially what it is. Yeah. Yeah. OK, that's enough for me. I'm going to open it up to the audience. Questions, please, back there. Yeah, there's, they aren't really distinct phases of a game, um, or they shouldn't be, right? Like, from the very beginning, um, you're, you have some ideas, and so you put those into the easiest possible implementation that you can, right? The easiest prototype you can do, and then you test those ideas, and then you refine them. And this happens, like, from the very beginning, right? Like, the first thing we had was this 
gray plane with a cube on it, and you could walk over to the cube and click on a, a thing, and it would pop up a an ugly box that's you know that had some text in it. That it had the text of the Raven, uh, the poem, and that's like what we we were like. Okay, you know, this is a world where you can walk over and read things, right? And like I don't know, it grows from there. We we gave it to people like very close friends and coworkers. Um, former coworkers, uh, very, very early on, um, got, got a prototype of like, this is, this is the basic idea of what the game is. And then based on that feedback, you know, we adjusted it and we did that all through development. Um, and so, yeah, everything kind of grows together. Um, I, I thought Gone Home was great and I found it very affecting. Um, but even as a consumer of the story, I, question whether or not I was having a true experience, whether or not it was in some ways, like I, just being a cis male and having this very affecting experience of uh, a lesbian young girl in, in a different time, I I was concerned if I was being manipulated or learning something untrue, like, you know, yep. the, it, I couldn't tell how far I was on the, on the, like, melodrama. I'm curious how you guys decided that you were telling something true and also, like, as a male, how you came to a, to a female, very female-centric story. Um, okay, so I should preface this by saying that I had uh, basically nothing to do with the story whatsoever. Um, Steve and Carla wrote the story, um, and the way that they did this, uh, Steve did a lot of research. Um, he actually did personal interviews with a bunch of uh, people, um, a bunch of women he knew who, who identified as lesbians and uh, told, told him their stories. Um, and he recorded these, uh, you know, and everything, and and used this to make sure that he was telling a true story, like as as you point out. And it is really hard, I think, to uh, to know when you're when you're doing that. Um, again, like the previous question, you know, if you if you give people this and say, does this fit with your experience? Like you you've lived this story. Um, I'm. I'm writing this based on what you've already told me, here's what I've got, give me feedback, and you kind of do this, do this sort of, sort of thing, and, uh, yeah. Simon? Um, it, it, you can just, like, pass on this if it's just annoying, because it sounds like everybody wants to hear about game stuff, but I have, like, a, like, a question about the argument about programming, right? Oh. Which is just, so, I mean, there's the, there's the argument, um, that if you don't, just use black box packages and tools, uh, then you can't actually see how they're limiting your um, your expression, right? And I guess I would say, like, I mean, number one, like, do you agree with that statement, or do you think that's basically a theoretical, like, school classroom uh, argument that doesn't actually have practical effect on the creative process? And I guess the other, the second part of that would be, do you think it's possible that right now it doesn't seem like just using a bunch of like you know community tools uh, and plugins and packages is 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 limiting in any way because we're still in this very creative, exciting, explosive phase. But maybe ten years down the road, when it's when we played a lot of, of games, walking through forests and caves and houses, and just hearing stories, right? Like the, new, the stories are new and interesting every time, but we get a lot of yeah. yeah. No, I totally understand what you're saying. Um, uh, so I think there's a possibility that that's, that that's, um, true. I mean, I think we've seen, right, this era of first person shooters, uh, that, that was the last, I don't know, 15 years or whatever of, of video games, right, where, um, first person shooters were, became big and then everyone wanted to make them. And so all of the engines adapted themselves to be first person shooter engines. And so the, tools that you had were well adapted to making first person shooters and you get this kind of like vicious cycle thing going on. Um, however, I think that uh, the very, I don't know, the, the ecosystem, the incredibly vibrant ecosystem tools that we have right now um, makes that less probable because um, there's so much more available. They're less based on these big companies trying to extract as much money as possible from the first-person shooter market, more based on very creative people trying to, I don't know, just make things for fun or, you know, art's sake or whatever, right? Um, I also think that uh, 
it's certainly possible to be kind of led down this this garden path of like, oh yeah, these are this is what I see, and so this is what I'm I'm going to make. But I also think that you you eventually you have ambitions that bump up against the edges of these things, right? And I think that creators will eventually find the limits of what they can do with technology when they say, I want to tell this story and damn it, that's not really possible with the tools that I have. And at that point, they'll begin to push those boundaries. I do think that there will be probably some kind of cyclical thing going on where we see a fallow era of like technological advancement right now, right? And then eventually maybe people will get sick of that stagnating and someone will make a, a big breakthrough. And, you know, one of these programmers sitting in the basement who really likes programming will will come up with something amazing, you know. Um, and, may, you know, I don't know, maybe that's happening right now at the same time. Like maybe the Oculus Rift is is that or something, you know. I, I don't know. But, um, yeah, I, I think, yeah. Josh. Is that something that you encounter, and do you think that, um, that that's one of the reasons why maybe um, gameplay programmers tend to like maybe uh, like to focus on the design a little more? Maybe? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely have encountered that. You you do have to if you're doing games right. Basically, you throw out a lot of stuff. You make things, and they don't work. Uh, or they don't work well enough, or you change your mind and you toss it out, right? Um, and I, I, I can see why you might say that would be fatiguing or frustrating or things like that. Um, I think you can alleviate that somewhat, actually, by like using off-the-shelf tools or whatever, right? Because then you're not, it's not your six months of hard work that you're tossing out the window. Hopefully, you're not iterating in six month uh, cycles or your game can take forever. But anyway, it's not your hard work you're throwing out, right? It's like, oh, I spent $5 on the asset store and it turns out uh, we're not going to do that thing anymore and, you know, whoops, uh, there's that, right? Um, uh, sorry, there's another part of your question I wanted to get to that I... Um, uh, well, lost in there, so... How do you how do you deal with it? Oh well, okay. So yeah, yeah. Uh, this is something that I um, basically don't commit yourself too early, right? Like this is the thing where if you if you design these amazing big systems, uh, especially if you write out a design document and you know on paper you're making these amazing things that will do everything, um, then when you sit down to make that and it doesn't work, you're going to be really frustrated. Um, and so if instead you say, okay, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Uh, what's the easiest way that I can test this idea? Like, it doesn't have to be something that will hold together long term, but how can I find out if this is something, excuse me, that I, that I really want to pursue? Um, so like in Gone Home, um, or actually uh, in a lot of ways in, in Bioshock too, um, a lot of what we would do... Um, for new systems and things like that is make some kind of in-editor tool so that uh, the designers who wanted to test something could do it themselves. Like it had, it was a lot of manual labor and it wasn't the best, most efficient way to do something necessarily. Um, but it was something where you say, okay, here's this tool, try it and see if this does what you want it to do. And if this seems, still seems like a good idea to you afterwards. And they would do that, and uh, a lot of times they would either say, okay, no, you're right, this is, or not, you're right, but okay, no, um, I was wrong, this is this is a shitty idea, let's not do this anymore, or they would say, okay, um, I still like this idea, but I learned that, you know, we need to provide these extra things, or, or whatever, you know, and by, you know, again, working iter iteratively uh, along those lines, you can come up with something that hasn't taken that much work to produce, hopefully. Um, and when you do sit down to put a bunch of the work into it, you have a good idea that it's what you really want um, and that now you're doing real work. 
And so, uh, as somebody else who's come from AAA and got into the open space, uh, and I'm, I'm always really curious, like, what are the what are the lessons you learned in AAA that you find are, I don't know, the the, the things you're gladdest you learned in AAA as opposed to having to learn from AAA? Yeah. Um... I think that, again, scoping is the biggest thing that, that I learned uh, in AAA, that we all learned, uh, the Gone Home team, um, that was the most important, is just like knowing what sort of labor you need to make a given thing um, of your own labor and other people's labor. Like, you know, you don't, when you set out to make a game, you might have ideas about like, yeah, having animated characters in it, right? And then if you know how much work it actually is to do that and what kind of knowledge you need to have or need to have on your team to, to achieve that, that's a really uh, good thing to know. Um, yeah, uh, I think there's also just this idea of being able to work with other people and draw knowledge from other disciplines uh, and know where your gaps lie and how to Fit other people into those gaps efficiently, basically. Um, <laughs> sounds, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yes. Go ahead. Uh, did, uh, did you find that having a smaller team and having everybody having a, a greater stake in the project led to a more efficient development process? And is that maybe why it, it, you came in under more schedule? Um, I think that's definitely part of it. Uh, I think, you know, uh, of course, the smaller team you have, uh, the less there is in communication overhead, right? Um, you know, you, there are fewer people that need to be brought in on any one decision. Um, and the faster you can, you can turn around and, and work. Um, I, I think we somewhat accounted for that, uh, you know, in our, in our estimates. Not entirely. I'm sure that that was, that was part of it. Um, but yeah. I mean, the reverse of that would be, were there situations where you were like, God, I wish we had 15 people on this team? Yeah, well, maybe not 15 people, but um, definitely, like, we had a gigantic bottleneck in uh, environment art. Uh, our environment artist, uh, Kate Craig, was was brilliant and really good at, at um, everything she did. But the problem with, you know, making this very dense, believable space is that you need a lot of objects and you need a lot of unique objects to fill it and make it feel like a real house, right? Um, and for one person to make all that stuff was was really, really hard. And Kate put in a ton of work. Um, we also ended up uh, contracting some things out, uh, uh, you know, that we, that we could do so. Um, in order to fill that. But yeah, we could have, you know, we, we had a big list of objects that we would have wanted to put in the game that didn't happen. The example that Steve gives all the time is shoes. Uh, if you look around the house, if you go into all the closets, there are no shoes anywhere, no shoes anywhere in the house. Um, and that's because it takes a lot of work to make that. And it's actually worse to have, like, if you make one pair of shoes and the um, family is wearing the same pair of <laughs> red high heels or whatever, you know, and they each got 20 pairs of them, it starts to look really bad, right? So if you if you commit to something like that, you need a a bunch of them for it not to look ridiculous, and we didn't have the time to do shoes, so no shoes. I never noticed. Yeah, well, you don't. Like that's that's another thing. If you had put in one pair, right, and like, it starts asking super questions weird. of like, yeah, what's going on there? But yeah, there's a lot of things you can do that way. You can't get. Is there how much of this could you possibly just get on the internet, like for for like through uh, through like a three D warehouse? Right. Yeah. And actually, we tried we tried some of that. Um, it's hard though to find assets that are of the quality level that we wanted. Um, a lot of stuff, uh, especially on the Unity Asset Store, a lot of it's meant for mobile development, so it's very, very low poly um, okay. and not something that you like to see wandering around a, a you know, fully realized 3D right. environment. Yeah. And it turns out not a lot of people make stuff for the 90s. Like, that's just not a very popular <laughs> game genre. It's so weird. The 90s. It's I don't so know weird. Happens. Yeah, if you want Space Man, you can find them, but not... not not Maybe you should have changed the theme. <laughs> <laughs> we could have, yeah. Right here. I don't want to ask about Gone Home in space, but uh, <laughs> so you keep talking about like uh, using all of these off the shelf tools, but you did write your own interface system. So, what percentage would you say of like the Gone Home then was written by y'all? Hmm. Um, like the, the wow. assets, not the percentage. 
Yeah, uh, that's that's a that's a good question. It's hard for me to. I mean, obviously, like in any game, the engine is the biggest part, right? And so, just by using Unity, like that's probably ninety five percent of the actual code of anything you're ever going to do with it, right? Um, but as far as once you ignore Unity, um, wow, it's actually really hard to say because uh, we well we downloaded or bought a lot of code. We also, none of it was 100% perfect for what we wanted, so I ended up rewriting or adding pieces to a lot of it. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Uh, sorry, it's it's really hard to judge, but I, I would say that actually, like, of the non-Unity stuff, probably, I don't know, 70% is stuff that, that I wrote, let's say. Because, um, you know, I mean, I did work for a year and a half writing code all day, every day, right? So that you produce a fair amount of code. Doing that. And, uh, so yeah. You, you typed some words. Yeah, I did. I typed a lot of words. And one more, one more. So I mean, you did allude to this in your talk to some extent, but um, and you say that it's really hard to answer, but like in terms of figuring out where the boundary lies between what do you write and what do you use? How much of like understanding that comes from the fact that you have like an extensive history of writing low level code? Uh, and so that you understand yeah. the implications, right? Or even when something goes wrong, because there's no way you can tell me that you use all this stuff and it doesn't explode every now and then. Oh yeah, yeah, right? it explodes constantly. <laughs> See? So I, mean, I think every game explodes constantly. But no, you're right. Um it's just it's it's such a hard question to answer because it's like uh, this this kind of self examination of like how do I know what I know right like how can I look at something and say um, I'm asking all about etymology right yeah well you know yeah, I, I I do have a philosophy degree so I should be able to answer this stuff but uh, <laughs> I think the first time I've used I think if you can't that proves that you're a good philosopher um, no but um, uh, yeah it's it's really hard for me to, to look at something and say I wouldn't know this if I hadn't if I hadn't done this this other thing. Um, but I think it is it is a matter of I think it is largely a matter of experience. I don't think you necessarily have to have experience in um, doing the low level programming or anything like that. But once you've made a game a few times, I think you can look at this and say, okay this is going to be a problem area. Like, this is something that we need to pay attention to because it's probably going to be an issue, right? Um, yeah, like physics. Yeah, like physics, right? Yeah. Uh, Always fun. Yeah, it is. Especially when you're not supposed to misbehave <laughs> in a house. Right. Yeah. You know, like, exactly. frames are not supposed to, like, fly right. through the ceiling. Yeah. Yeah. That realistic, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's perfect. No, but I think you, yeah, I don't know. I think once you, yeah, again, once you make a game a, a certain number of times, experience... Experience is always going to be valuable, uh, right, in doing anything. Like, even if it's the easiest thing possible to make a game, uh, having done it 50 times is going to mean you're, go you're going to make it more easily, more quickly, oh, yeah. and probably to a better degree of quality than never having done it before. So would you say that Unity is the currently, like, the, like, the best possible abstraction? Oh, no. I mean, Unity is terrible in a lot of ways. Like, it's, it's, it's awful. I, they have so many things they need to fix. Um, uh, there's there's no way that it's that it's the best possible and and you know also it is it is meant for a very particular kind of game right like I also brought up Game Maker and Twine which right. are are other tools that are better for making right. other kinds of games right um, and I'm sure that everybody out there will continue to make cool exciting engines that are better for some things and you know I mean you're already seeing Unity's effect on like the Unreal Engine and Crisis and all of the other like triple A uh, titans, right? Um, right? They're they're changing their business model and they're hopefully changing their their code and and kind of design uh, also to, to catch up. I'm happy that there's a diversity of engines. Yeah, no, me too. That's I, a great thing. I use processing. <laughs> it's oh, barely an engine. Wow. <laughs> you know, like processing. Guess what? It's good for prototyping your own games. Yeah, sure. Very very good. I can't make Gone Home in it. But, but hey, yeah, not everybody yeah. needs to be Gone Home. Okay, let's wrap it up. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for